tienen en común? El iPhone, el Android e eBay. Los teléfonos inteligentes o smartphones son dispositivos indispensables que casi la mitad de la población mundial usa a diario. eBay fue de hecho la inspiración para uno de los unicornios más prominentes de la región, Mercado Libre, y también del origen de lo que hoy conocemos como la mafia de PayPal, que facilitó la creación de compañías como LinkedIn, Facebook, Tesla, SpaceX, YouTube y muchos más. ¿Se puede rastrear el origen de este universo tecnológico en un momento de Big Bang que involucró magia, los cerebros más innovadores del planeta y un creador en el centro de todo esto, Mark Porat? General Magic y la historia de perso personal de Mark son un relato de inmortalidad de los sueños. Cara a diez décadas, mentes iluminadas generan ideas que se transforman en estrellas brillantes con sus sistemas de planetas que orbitan alrededor de ellas, donde se genera vida y donde las ideas se convierten en productos impactantes. Mark es una estrella brillante y poderosa, un creador y visionario quien en más de una ocasión nos dio el regalo de una idea que pudo brillar a través de generaciones e innovadores y que sobrevivieron fracasos iniciales. Mark hizo su doctorado en Stanford, es un Aspen Fellow y también fundó compañías para contrarrestar el cambio climático antes de que estas eh, iniciativas estu estuviesen de moda. Compañías como Sears Materials, Calstar Products y Zeta Communities. En un momento histórico de crisis, de cambios, de incertidumbres, no podría haber una historia más esperanzadora que la de General Magic. Una historia de victoria, a pesar de los obstáculos. Es un tremendo honor el presentarles a Mark Porat, un querido amigo y una de las personas más iluminadas y generosas que he tenido el placer de conocer en mi vida. Por favor, acompáñenme en darle la bienvenida a este contenedor virtual a Mark. In Silicon Valley, there's a lot of origin stories of companies that were at, had the right idea but were completely at the wrong time, and, and yet they paved the path for everything else. There are a handful of stories that define Silicon Valley. You know, there, there are legends, and General Magic was one of the legends. You have to believe, you have to be proud, you have to be absolutely convinced that you're going to bend the way the world is moving, and you're going to take it in a different direction. If you're always playing it safe and you're not failing, there's a very high probability you're not doing anything particularly important. No matter how big we dreamed, the fact that you could touch the lives of billions, billions, it was vaguely imaginable, but the scale of it was inconceivable. The reason you should care about the story of General Magic is because it involves something fundamental, and that is, failure isn't the end. Failure is actually the beginning. Good evening. Good to be with you here um, virtually uh, at the end of what must have been a, just a, an amazingly packed and, and stimulating uh, conference. It's good to be here because, in part, you are my people. <laughs> You're the community I, I, I love the most and understand, uh, I think, part of the culture and just delighted to tell the story, uh, as the filmmakers did so brilliantly, about General Magic and what we learned. It's a genesis story. It's an origin story of something amazing. <laughs> 
And therefore, it's also a technology and a business story. But it's also something that for me personally and, and, and for others I, I, I hear is a personal story. It's intensely human. It's a love story, which means it has all of the passion and the romance and the ups and the downs and the pleasure and the pain of love. And at the end, something interesting and good happens. So I remember Alan Kay, who was an Apple fellow when, when I was there, famously said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So with that, let's go on and see the story. There comes a moment where for some reason you are in the future and you see something very, very clearly. You just see it. That's what happened to me. And I went into the future and I saw the world which, which I thought was very real and very tangible. And I stood in that moment inside it and I looked around my, me. And it was there. It was all, it was all there. It was basically the general magic vision. It was going to be so revolutionary that it would take over the world. So this book I wrote in 1989, and this was a compilation of, of the ideas. And it was called Pocket Crystal. And this is what we came up with in 1989. And there it is. We really had it. <laughs> we definitely had it. Those are the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, just stunningly beautiful. But where do visions come from? Where did this originate? Well, do they just fall out of the sky divinely into your brain? In my case, not at all. I'd finished a PhD in economics at Stanford University, which, which basically analyzed and documented the emergence of the information economy, where information Machines, technologies, knowledge workers would become the dominant sector, the driver of advanced economies. And with that, I was recruited into the Aspen Institute, where you saw uh, that little clip. And in, at the Aspen Institute, I thought about it a lot. In fact, made a film uh, called The Information Society, which was an introduction of where we were going as a society with all of the goods and all of the issues from, from have-nots and privacy to tremendous uh, power and, and newness of everything. And so I wrote a piece of paper, one piece of paper, that said, the future seems to me to be a, a convergence of you standing in the middle of tiny little computation devices that are with you all the time, mobile, and wireless communication, and what I call publishing content, which included electronic commerce. So that was a little piece of paper. And Larry Tesler, my friend, chief scientist of Apple, recruited me to Apple with that piece of paper because I had to do it. That's the love part. In when you are gripped by something so deeply and so strongly that you cannot help yourself, you turn a little bit deaf and, deaf and blind to any of the consequences, you just need to do it. And so I just gladly picked up and went to New York with my family to join Apple and to try and get it done. Let's take a look. Email from me to John Scully. We realized that the root of our strength was that we understood how people use information machines better than anyone else. This is our early vision for the product. A tiny computer, a phone, a very personal object. It must be beautiful. It must offer the kind of personal satisfaction that a fine piece of jewelry brings. It will have a perceived value even when it is not being used. It should offer the comfort of a touchstone 
the tactile satisfaction of a seashell, the enchantment of a crystal. Once you use it, you won't be able to live without it. It's just not another telephone. It must be something else. Well, I'd like to be able to say that Apple had open arms and embraced me and the idea, but that was actually not so either. <laughs> the Apple at that time was, was sinking. The Mac was losing market share uh, to Windows, which had, of course, the Windows interface. The company could have gone broke then, 1988, 89. And here I come, out of the outside, like a piece of uh, foreign protein, uh, and say to the establishment, um, Apple, computers are not your future. <laughs> your futures are these little things, these little handheld phones, these, 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 these magical little objects that communicate, and people use as smartphones, essentially. Uh, and the culture was not all that interested. <laughs> However, the CEO, John Scully, introduced me to two programmers. They weren't software engineers at the time. Programmers. And that was in 1990 or so. And by then, you know, the software community was so small that they actually had lists of who are the top 10 programmers in the world. In the world. <laughs> They're now... Millions. And if you think about object-oriented programming, there might be billions. Um, but at that time, two of the ten, Bill Atkinson and Andy Hertzfeld, um, Andy had written the Mac kernel pre pretty much by himself, the OS. And they were amazing. And so I brought my idea to them, and they liked it, and they joined, and... That's how it happened. A lot of amazing people rallied to the idea. And you have to have an idea that's so clear. And as a, an evangelist, you have to be so strong about representing clearly what it is you want to do to be able to, I guess, recruit or bring in the kind of talent that it takes to push through into an amazing future. Let's take a look. Common ground between Apple and what we did at General Magic and the 60s was idealism. Our art could make a difference in, in the lives of everyone. Everyone you know and everyone you don't know. I, I think uh, communications is the most fundamentally human thing that we do. And that's, that's really why what we're doing cuts to the heart of, of, of who we are. Uh, that's what distinguishes people more than any other thing, I think, than uh, the sense of community, a sense of, of uh, reaching out from yourself to, to someone else. One of the things Bill and I do is just by word of mouth, passing, passing that spirit down, down to the next generation. So here we had an amazing team. It was really one of the best places to work at the time. I think you may have seen Tony Fidel's search to how to get there, which was really special. And uh, we started working. Uh, I assembled a, a, a uh, founding partners uh, council, really, uh, with the best companies in the world. Uh, these are consumer electronic companies, Sony, Panasonic, Philips, communication companies, AT&T, NTT, France Telecom, and so on, uh, to push this thing uh, to, through. We were going to do sort of everything except personal computers. We were going to do phones, uh, tablets, uh, TV boxes, pretty ambitious, and too ambitious. And we got going, and it was a heavy lift. We were inventing everything because we had the talent and the money to do that. And we tried it. And then we got very far down the road, but we were missing deadlines. And things became pressured and difficult. The romantic start, that blissful state, had turned a bit to something that was hard. Having said that, it was still amazing. And you'll see that in just a moment. One night, Sunday I think, 
And I walk into the building and I hear slam, slam, bang, bang, bang. No idea what was going on, no idea. And just banging away, building what looked to me like bunk beds. I said, guys, what, what are you doing here? And they said, we're building bunk beds. Why do you need to build a bunk bed in your office? Why don't you go home to sleep? We had to go up against it, pull it together to get something out the door. We got to get serious. I remember like sleeping on, you know, some random mattress on the floor of the house. We didn't care about all this. We didn't care whether we had furniture or anything. We we're just doing this thing. Oh, yeah. So we were just working all out all the time. Um, and I, I was actually sleeping under my desk sometimes. And then I would get up in the morning and just start working again. <laughs> it's nighttime. People are clustered around a handful of, of machines. Uh, the rabbit's running around under their feet. Uh, the parrot is squawking and shitting all the time. It smelled horrible. <laughs> Uh, it, it was dank, musty, you know, it smelled of sweat and exhaustion, and no one wanted to be anywhere else. But we'll have it, we'll have it tomorrow morning, right? So, so... Every single one of us, it was all hands on deck, ship or die. There was this constant drumbeat of, we have to ship, we have to ship, we have to ship. In terms of intensity and pressure, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. In some ways, we were never closer to each other, and we never felt better about what we were doing because we were getting there. So it got serious. That little clip, I think, demonstrates a lot of your lives at certain moments of what you're doing. It's something you know well, and hopefully your family and significant others appreciate what it's like to be in that mode, especially with a group of such talented people with such an ambitious goal. It was exactly as portrayed. We all worked really hard. Now, uh, the bunk bed story, the people building the bunk, bunk beds, <laughs> one of them was Andy Rubin. Uh, Andy went on, as you probably know, uh, to create uh, Android. Sitting about 15 feet away from, from Andy Rubin, like over there and up there, one cubicle, uh, was Tony Fidel, who went on to create uh, iOS, the iPhone. And I make this point in the film, but it's worth thinking about and reflecting on. Within a few feet of each other, five meters, two guys working on the technology went on in their lives to create what is now 98% of all the smartphones on planet Earth. <laughs> so we sort of knew that. We sort of knew that we had that in our vision and in our grasp if we could just do it. Now, what was going on back in 1995? Well, digital cellular was just okay, starting in, in Europe, GSM, GSM and you know, elsewhere. It had not really arrived at all in the United States. We were analog. And we couldn't do all the stuff we needed to do uh, without digital cellular for security, for, for big objects, and that had to move across um, uh, the internet, essentially. And the internet was arriving. The internet at that time was tiny. It seemed big, but it was tiny compared to today. <laughs> in fact, uh, the first Netscape browser uh, came along and we demoed it and it was, uh, it crashed. I mean, it just, you couldn't keep it going and it was trying to crawl the web. So there we were um, trying to build this, uh, actually trying to put the web in the ROM to ship it. And it was tough. It was really tough. And that's what you saw in that culture, in that moment. And it was exactly as portrayed. There was always something else to be tuned up. There was some bug to be caught. There was some memory leak to be plugged up. And the date got later and later and later. I'd made commitments. The company had made commitments. And the commitments were now being undone by our inability or maybe even cultural unwillingness to let something out the door that wasn't like perfect. And I felt the first wave, you know, that first zap of terror. We were too dazzled by what it could possibly do to kind of 
realized we were biting off more than we could chew. Well, I was still in creative mode, working on a flipping coin. Uh, so the game room would have something in it, whereas you tap the coin, it would flip around heads or tails and gave you a random number for feedback and all. And I was setting a bad example uh, for the team by doing stuff that was relatively frivolous when we needed to concentrate on the boring uh, but necessary parts. And it really made me do some soul searching that I was kind of uh, leading people astray and not having quite the right uh, seriousness of our situation. So it was serious. We'd gone public to raise a lot of money to be able to create this as a global standard. And we were not getting there. And eventually, if you saw the film, you know that it did not work. It crashed and burned. And it was so sad for so many people who had given so much for so many years to make a vision happen. And we got pretty close. And I think one of the important parts of this piece of the movie is the reflection and the insight that one gets by going through an experience like that. It was a peak experience while it was rocking and rolling. And it was a peak experience when it was crashing in the opposite direction. And that's life. Uh, life is ebbs and flows and ebbs again and flows again and that's the expectation we have going forward, especially if we're doing something really hard with purpose and with meaning. Life is ebbs and flows. When a wave crashes on the shores and the rocks here, you don't think of the wave as having failed. <laughs> you think of the wave as having done its thing. And the next wave will come, and the next wave. And that's how I think of general magic moment in time. So here's the chronology, just to remember. I arrive in Apple in 1988. We spin out in 1990, early 91. We have our product introduction in 1995. And then, almost to the day, 12 years later, here's what happens. Let's go ahead and turn it on. All righty. I was proud to think that, yeah, my God, they did it. Tony did it. Everything we wanted to do, there it is. And on the other hand, um, I was sad that it wasn't us. But I also felt vindicated in some way that the ideas had been right, the timing had been wrong. Steve would often call me after like the big product introductions just to see what, what I thought. 4 p.m. I was in my office and got a call from Steve. I was like, oh, what do you think? What do you think? And it was like the worst cell phone connection I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was all like, you can hear Steve, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the first thing I asked him was, are you talking on an iPhone? <laughs> he goes, no, no, no. <laughs> but I think he was. Steve told me on the phone he thought a lot about MagicCap during the course of the iPhone development and in particular mentioned the projected keyboard. He had seen that and used it with MagicCap and that gave him faith that that was the right direction to go. Hey Zarko. Oh, hi Andy. Hi, I'm in the middle of giving uh, a demo of MagicCap for cell phones. It's really exciting. It, it, it's working great. You well, guys, you guys did a great it's job. Incredible. Yeah, yeah, I hear it. It's almost like you're like in the next room or something. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> yeah, okay. Bye. So how does Silicon Valley work? How does an ecosystem work? What's the history of technology and of science and of evolution and innovation? Actually, that could be true of philosophy or math or any other domain. The answer is we all build on each other's experiences, on our own experiences. And we take those a short distance, historically speaking, and then someone else takes it and moves along into the future. And 
some of the satisfaction and some of the, some of the actual real meaning uh, that is a takeaway for me personally is portrayed in this next clip. Imagine a star that went supernova and everything that you touch today, everything you interact with today technology-wise is because that star power touched it. I mean, all these companies, and I don't know if you add up the value of those, what it would be, but they all had their genesis with this crew of just a few dozen people who were at General Magic. It was one of the only times I've ever felt like there's no weak link in this chain. Everyone on this team uh, is brilliant, is so committed and passionate. What's so rare is having all those things at the same time. When you look at that class of people and what the world looks like today, that was the training ground for us, for what has shaped the world of today. We all carry things from General Magic in terms of our uh, view of what could be possible in the future. And as engineers, you, know, you can't help but think, is it, is it, can we do this now? How about now? Several people, many people, in the past 10 years have observed, have said to me, you know, the most amazing product of General Magic was what happened afterwards. The people that, with the ideas, where they went and what they did. And I'm just calling out a couple. I've already mentioned Tony and Andy. We were the adults in the room and we had some children. <laughs> and Megan Smith was one of those children. Well, MIT PhD, not exactly a child. Um, and running a chunk of, of Apple Japan, so not exactly a child, but young. And Megan went on to be the vice president of Google X, obviously out there, moonshot level thinking. And then the chief technology officer for President Obama, a child, grown up. <laughs> so in some sense, that is what we were able to ship into the future, is technology, ideas, conviction, and purpose, a sense of real purpose. It's time to close with the last clip, and then we'll be back for a conversation. How can we take this same idea of bold, dramatic change to help create a better society? We are going to have to invent those things and do it in all of these other domains that are being touched or revolutionized by technology. It may seem daunting, it may seem difficult, it may seem impossible, but if you just find the right people and keep seeking out knowledge and advice and keep staying open to make a better world, regardless of where you come from, great things can happen. We judge things by the moment at which we feel that they've made a, a, an impact on the mass culture. They're in the anthropology. They're in the culture of how we see ourselves and how we come to expect the world to be. And I don't think that'll happen for another 10 years. I think we'll build to it incrementally, and every quarter and every year it'll get closer and closer. But I don't think it'll be until the 21st century when the stuff we're working on today becomes unexceptional. Unexceptional. Not worth making a video about. And, and that's the test of, except for historical documentary purposes, <laughs> and, and that's the test of, uh, of, hey, we've made it. We've really made a difference. We've really changed the world. Acaba de terminar el magistral keynote de Mark Porat y bueno, eh, esto es eh, un privilegio para nosotros. Ahora el Q&A eh, no lo voy a estar haciendo yo porque no soy digno, así que el Q&A lo va a estar haciendo Rebeca Juan. Rebeca es cofundadora y general, par general partner en Calais Ventures y senior director del Center for Global Entrepreneurship and Family Business de Thunderbird Schools of, School of Global Management. Es emprendedora tecnológica ha vivido en Silicon Valley por dos décadas, es muy amiga de Mark Porat, por lo que trae una perspectiva de insider, y ella enseña en Stanford también, y la WF la nombró como Young Global Leader. Así que ahora esto va a ser obviamente en inglés, así que vamos a cambiar al inglés y ya los dejo eh, con Rebecca y Mark. Rebecca, Mark, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Welcome. Thank you again for joining us, and I will just leave it up to you. 
Muchísimas gracias, Mariano. Y eh, buenas tardes, buenas noches para todos los que nos están mirando de muchos países en América Latina. Qué placer estar de nuevo con ustedes. Y hoy eh, tenemos la oportunidad muy, muy eh, única de hacer preguntas a Mark. A, ustedes lo vieron en el documental, saben lo visionario que es eh, y la influencia que ha tenido en el mundo de la tecnología en los últimos años. Así que, bueno, este es el show de ustedes. Yo estoy acá solamente como facilitadora. Eh, estamos mirando y monitoreando eh, el chat. Así que agreguen y voten sus preguntas. Así les preguntamos, le preguntamos a Mark eh, las preguntas más populares. Hi, Mark. Nice to see you again. Hi, <laughs> Thank you so much for making time. Um, everybody is just so excited. They, they just watched the documentary. They watched your keynote. And uh, the chat window is really, really bubbling up with questions about uh, the past, the present, and the future. So today we'll try to give a little bit of everything to our audience. Um, so I want to actually start with a question that uh, refers to your keynote. And one of my favorite things that you say is that this is a story of love, a love story. It's not really just a story of technology, of Silicon Valley, but really it's about love uh, and passion. Um, and beyond the uh, borders of Silicon Valley and, and the world of technology, why do you think that this is a an important story to share right now in the world, in the context that we live in? Ah, great question. <clears throat> I would say that the world is now not overwhelmed by a surplus of love. What do you think? Um, it's, uh, it's a difficult time to live. I, I, I think I have empathy for, for what the audience is living through. Uh, there's probably more severe even than what we're living through and I don't want to get political but these are not the best of times. Um, and so that's, and, and that's the opposite of, of sort of the personal story, the Genesis story that we, that we just saw. Now the connection is kind of interesting and I might want to start just a little bit and maybe there are questions or critique about that, um, which is part of what we created. I, and I tease, you know, Andy Hertzfeld uh, uh, and, and, and the rest of them, part of what we created Um, is beautiful. It is, it, is, it is the connective tissue of people with themselves, as I say in the film, with their intimate others, their family, their children, their, their significant others, um, and, and the relationship with the larger world, which is so important. Uh, it's commercially, economically, financially essential. We couldn't live without it. And it is exactly the opposite side of that coin is exactly the pernicious, the difficult, the dark aspects of what Andy created. <laughs> It's not Andy's fault, my fault. But what we actually created as a, as a tech community, and I don't need to go into it. I think that the entire audience is extremely sophisticated and you understand exactly what I'm talking about in code language. Um, there are things and there are people who have ascended to power uh, because of Facebook and Twitter. Um, who don't deserve it. And there are, there's information and misinformation and downright lies and slander and, and uh, viciousness. It's traveling on exactly the same TCP IP, the same exact Wi-Fi, the same exact smartphones that we use for love. And that's the challenge, I think, that um, I didn't know that your question would be that, <laughs> the first question, but that's the challenge in part is that any technology has power and the application of that power is what we're struggling with at this time. You know, that, that leads me to a follow-up question and I think uh, you're referring to the unintended consequences of innovation and change, especially when that change has uh, so many ramifications and, and reaches a massive scale. So, I think lately I'm thinking a lot about legacy <laughs> in, in, in general, because we are uh, in a pivotal point in, in the life of the planet, not just our individual lives. And uh, for many, 2020 has been a year, as you said yesterday, a year of reckoning, a, re a year of perspective, you know, 2020 vision as well. Um, what do you think the legacy of uh, the story of General Magic is? Uh, the legacy uh, of any company 
uh, that creates tremendous impact. And also from the personal perspective, you know, what is the legacy that uh, you would love to, to leave to this world as part of your business career and personal life? Oh, that's interesting. Well, <laughs> Let's start with the easy question, right? <laughs> you know, I, you know the, the, as, as, as I think I, I mentioned in the film, maybe, maybe not, I don't recall, is that the, the, the best, one of the best things that we did at General Magic, the thing that is, in fact, I think the legacy, um, is the inspiration and the explosion, supernova, the explosion of incredibly talented people who got the vision were able to not only embrace the vision internally, but improve on it by a factor of 10 and go off into the world with confidence, but also with an understanding of what to be careful about in implementing strategies and visions. You know, Tony Fidel became better as a better human being, as a better leader because of what he experienced in general magic. That's a gift that he got. It wasn't the gift that, that's not what we set out to do is to teach people, but nonetheless, people took away uh, certain wisdom and certain learning, and they went everywhere, everywhere in um, in the best companies in Silicon Valley, in quite senior positions, a chief technology officer of this, or senior vice president of that, or CEO of the following, and that's the legacy. It's the it's in part, you know, and turning to your second uh, uh, part of your of your comment, those of you out there who are parents or who are becoming thinking of being parents, um, and all of you are children of someone. We're all children of someone. What's in our minds, what's in our memories, and what's in the memories of our children about us is the only legacy. That's the immortality, if you wish, of it all. And so um, my kids didn't really know me uh, while I was going through the general magic experience. I, it, it was very hard for me to achieve a level of vulnerability where I was willing to even approach any of that um, and they got damaged in part by that experience but there was enough of me there and there was enough of now their understanding of who I am and who I was that that's in their minds as they design their lives as they conduct their you know their both their professional and their personal lives that's the legacy that's meaningful on a personal level and, the, and on a more global level for me personally, I know, you know, when I, <laughs> I must confess, when I see people around, you know, around just living a normal life, um, you know, looking at their iPhones or looking at their Android, you know, machines, little things, you know, some little part of me says, hmm, there it is. And it's modest, but it's, daily. <laughs> and that's the part of the legacy that's actually very satisfying and fulfilling also. Yeah, absolutely. I think what you refer to is uh, this uh, healing and repair that has happened uh, since the experience. And in some ways, when you listen to the story of Tony, Tony Fadell and many others who are in the movie, they speak to uh, the, the opportunity that they had to reach that level of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. you know, he talked a lot about how he had to really apply himself to understanding his, his magic, his powers, you know, um, and that was so helpful to his life and his career. And that, that is a, a, an amazing legacy that you're leaving to every magician who participated. And so I'll go to one of the questions from the chat window. Uh, they do ask uh, whether that emotional recovery, healing, repair, you know, how has it been completed? What was that process? And I think they asked this question because so many of us are going through experiences right now, especially this year, that will have to heal in the future. And so, you know, we're all thinking about ourselves. And related to that, um, I think what people have really admired uh, of the movie is the fact that there's this tension between business and idealism. And this is the second question I'm taking from the, from the chat, from the audience. Um, you know, is this story of General Magic a story of uh, failure to combine idealism and business in the right proportions, right? Um, and when you go through an experience that is so impactful like this, how do you still keep that idealism? <laughs> um, so those are two related questions, you know, the emotional recovery, and idealism versus business. 
Yeah. Okay. Really good questions. And, uh, and, and these are, I think, permanent questions that people wrestle with among others is those two questions. I think they're universal uh, questions. It makes no difference whether, what level of society you're in or what level of achievement or accomplishment or wealth. Those are permanent types of questions because they're, they're what motivates us, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, to, to evolve, to grow, to survive. Um, one of the things that's to be said is that doing anything requires a level of, um, the word isn't exactly aggression, but it's related to aggression. It, it, it requires a toughness. It requires a, um, you know, a blowing down, walking through walls. It requires um, a, a kind of a courage that's, in retrospect, could be a little bit foolish. Uh, you know, it's an expression, if, if I had known how hard, it, if people would know how hard it is to start companies, no one would start companies. I mean, they, so, so it does take a toughness. And I, and I mentioned in the film, and it is truly true, that it takes an, a willingness to, um, to not be too introspective, to not dwell in the possibilities of failure. Because if you do, you're paralyzed and you can't do anything. Just cannot do anything that's hard or meaningful. Um, or maybe even satisfying, I, I don't know. Now I say that without judgment. I, I'm trying to say this without judgment or, or, or you know, moral you know, imperative. Um, because there's something comforting about staying inside your comfort zone. I mean, that's why they call it a comfort zone. And, and breaking out of it is both a growth experience as well as extremely prone to danger and personal damage. And if you can keep those two things in your mind or in your heart at the same time, then you're doing something that most people cannot do. <laughs> so one of the things I, I learned, and this gets to your question, I think both questions really, but, but certainly to the personal uh, question, is we're taught that when you're an entrepreneur, and I think that of the, I don't know how many thousands of people there are in the, in the audience today, um, when you're taught um, to, to be in an entrepreneur or in an entrepreneurial setting, the requirement is to work flat out 24-7, 365, as hard as you can, and build bunk beds, you know, <laughs> do whatever it takes because it's, it's a hard thing to do. And you give your entire soul and spirit and time to that thing because, after all, that's probably going to increase the likelihood of success. That is false, not true. And the learning and the lesson for me personally, and maybe for others, is as you're giving everything, you can't save a piece inside you for yourself, for yourself, just for yourself as a place of refuge, as a place of privacy, as a place of, of recharge and nourishment. Also a place for your immediate family, your loved ones, a place for them because they get crowded out also. And by not saving a place or by not honoring that place, you're guaranteeing that you will, well, you're increasing the likelihood by a lot that you're not gonna make it. Because any of these large, dreams and visions is, is it, it, you know, you run and you run and you run and you run. And just by the time you finish, you're finished running, you have to run some more. You climb the mountain and when you think you're at the top, all you see is that there's another mountain beyond it. That's the nature of these things. So you have to preserve yourself. So that's the, you know, that's kind of a comment on the first question. And as to the second one, how can you possibly know, how can one possibly know um, uh, how to balance idealism and business? Because you're blind when you go into something. You can only know in retrospect. And so in another interesting puzzle, some of the best business people I know are not interested in anything I just said. Irrelevant. Emotion, the personal dimension, uh, uh, feelings are, are nothing but uh, distractions from getting on with business. And that if you're just hardcore business, business, money, money, success, success, 
and crush the competition and you know be as aggressive as you can all the time, that's a better thing. You know, and when you look at the and there's no idealism. The, the, the idealism, the idea is to make money. Period. And that's a that's a very uh, focusing objective function. Uh, there are no there aren't, there aren't a lot of variables to that one. Uh, it, pre it prepares it presents clarity. Now that's not who I am. And um, you know, for me, if you want to if you want to think about it, the world is divided between you know wets and dries. <laughs> The wets are, are, are people like a general magic who, who actually live on emotion, live on idealism, live on passion, may or may not succeed. The dries are people who are, have no interest in that and they're as likely to succeed or fail as the wets. That's why there's no moral judgment around this thing. You just need to know who you are. Uh, I, I want to, I'm so uh, excited to ask this follow-up question because I I just read a quote, which, you know, some people place to Buddha, but uh, I, I think it's just one of those uh, phrases uh, that are famous and nobody knows who said it first. But, you know, they say that um, what is painful is not change. Uh, what is painful is the resistance to change. Um, and I think that's true, that if you resist something that's happening where you have no control, that is very uncomfortable, going back to your comfort zone comment. And idealists like yourself tend to take control and, and say, I will be the agent of change. I will create change. And in some cases, change is um, so dramatic that you can absolutely disrupt the way the world is, right? Like the, the iPhone and Android have, have done. Now, do you think that's part of the, the pain uh, in, of this experience was that there was resistance by the world and reality to the change that you wanted to affect at that point? So, in, in, you know, the resistance to change goes both ways. <laughs> uh, when you are the recipient who's resisting, it's painful. When you are the agent of change and there's resistance by, by the world, it's also painful, especially mm -hmm. for idealists. What do you think? Let's talk about pleasure, which is exactly the opposite of your question. It's the other frame of your question. Um, and let's talk about um, um, a, a, uh, a, a, an imperative to do something. So I think that if you look historically at any field, it makes no difference what it is, whether it's electrical engineering or whether it's, or whether it's um, medicine or whether it's politics for that matter, uh, change agents get crushed, they just do, um, because that's the definition of a change agent. You're, cha you're trying to change something. Um, and and <laughs> it goes back to what I said before. Um, if change agents knew what, it, you know, what, what uh, price they might have to pay, nobody would want to be a change agent. But there's a compulsion or, or a requirement that you feel inside if you are one of these people, and there's no reason why you should be, None. But if you're one of those people, you kind of don't have much choice in the matter. And, um, and I think that, you know, when you read history or even current uh, events, but when you certainly when you read history, um, history is full of people who tried to change something and, uh, and were uh, killed, literally, or failed or paid a price uh, of some sort um, that was... Um, extraordinary. Now, I don't think of myself, and I never did, in, in kind of glamorous historical terms. I just had an idea and had to do it. <laughs> so, so um, and, and that created, uh, yes, and that created pain, but I take, you know, I take ownership of what happened. And there's, you know, I think saying they resisted, they caused pain, um, might be true, might be, might be objectively true. Uh, there really are enemies who are out to get you, you know, and often do, but that's not the way I experienced it. It's not the way I remember it. Um, you know, I just, you know, and I think all the magicians that are, you know, they were in a leadership position, and maybe everyone uh, took responsibility. We set ourselves, you know, with enormous uh, goals. We were in part uh, fed by that. That was the energy that we had to keep going. If we had little dreams, we would have a little bit of energy. <laughs> and we had, you know, the, the big dreams, I'll confess, 
in a parenthesis, I will confess. What we said to ourselves is Apple and Microsoft and IBM can have computers. We'll take everything else, everything from telephones to, you know, to TVs, set boxes, which, you know, which is absurd. So we quickly divested ourselves of that uh, hubris and focused on, on what we did. <clears throat> but a big dream gives you a lot of energy and, and also attracts interesting people. And also the higher you climb, the farther you're gonna fall. It's just Newton. <laughs> it's the, and we climb pretty high. Now, so did the Google boys, so did uh, Bill Gates, so did uh, Jeff Bezos, so did you know uh, Steve Jobs. So did so. It doesn't necessarily mean that by dreaming big, you're going to fail. Uh, by dreaming big, you might make big happen. Uh, some of it is skill, some of it is luck, a lot of it is timing. That's probably one of the things I got wrong. You know, I kind of overachieved. You know, if it would take me five more years to spin out of Apple, then by then, digital cellular would have been there, the web would have been there, websites would have been there, et cetera. And, and you know, and the behavior of uh, communicating via email and chatting and texting and all of that would have been well established in muscle memory of people. So we overachieved. I did, you know, I did too well. Uh, we spun out in 1990, 1991. And uh, and that and so our timing was completely wrong, uh, and as I you know as we know twelve years later it was completely right. So I have to take full responsibility, and I think all the magicians do. Um, I'm going to switch now to a couple more questions from the audience. Uh, voy a pasar algunas preguntas a ustedes. Uh, Julian Len is asking if you notice any differences in terms of developers back then and developers now, uh, given that a lot of our audience uh, is made of developers and uh, programmers and technical people. And related to that, Emmanuel actually asks uh, if uh, you have any lessons learned or advice on how to manage top talent, because you mentioned, you know, all these amazing magicians you put together. Um, so difference between before and now in terms of developer talent and when you have top talent, uh, what are some of your uh, tips on how to manage them? What's the name of the person that asked the developer question? Julian. Julia, okay. Hi. Um, how are you? So I gather you're a developer and, um, and uh, I, I don't know what you're developing, but there is a big difference between what it was like in 1990s and what it is like today. Uh, today, it's both a lot easier and a lot harder. Uh, about why? Back then, there were so few developers, so few software engineers that they kind of knew everything. So there were no, they weren't specialists. You know, they were full stack because we didn't even know what full stack meant. It just, it's just, well, you go, you went to work and you had to create something. <laughs> so everybody knew everything about, you know, pretty much. Uh, most people knew about everything. There wasn't that much to know. I mean, there really wasn't. I mean, the programming languages back then were, uh, you know, comparison to today, uh, uh, much, much more simple. Remember Java had not been created, if you can, if you can imagine. We had to create our own interpreted uh, portable language called Telescript doesn't even talk about it in the film, but we have to create our own Java, um, and which we did. Um, so, so it was easier at that time to get your arms around the whole thing. Now it's very specialized. As with every field that's mature, you develop specialists. And I think that one of the keys to the whole thing is to, is to try as best you can, it's intellectually very taxing, but to try as best you can to, be, to, to remain a journalist. Uh, to know uh, about a lot of things and to have an, an understanding at least um, um, of what your, in a, if it's a large team, of what your colleagues and co-workers are doing. Uh, otherwise, uh, you lose empathy. And as soon as you've lost empathy, you've lost the company. You've lost, you know, you've lost the culture. Uh, so that's one thing I would, uh, I would say. I would also say that, that software and hardware, uh, we're, we're always connected. I mean, our, our hardware engineers understood, you know, how to spin ASICs, uh, but they also understood how to program. In our high-level user interface, you know, UX people, they call them now, we didn't, um, uh, you know, understand how the, you know, how assembly work, language works, and how the, how the ROM works inside the computer. So try and stay broad. 
And I know that's hard because you can barely keep up with your own field, <laughs> which is exploding, but try and stay uh, global. Now, in regard to, uh, to how to manage leadership talent, Manuel, um, the um, hard to say. Uh, there's one thing that is true. And I might have a chance to mention that later in connection with a project I'm doing in Napa, uh, California. But one thing is true, uh, which is any team, any group of people is going to have dysfunctionality uh, built into it. Because each of us individually has some you know, internal dysfunctionality. And when you put that into a group setting, uh, wow, the egos uh, flare. Um, yesterday, I talked about ego as a good thing. If you don't have ego, you have no drive to walk through walls and no drive to do anything. Got to have ego. But it's that same thing, flip it upside down, that in a team setting uh, has, to be, has to be managed, has to be modulated. And it seems to me that the role of a leader is to, um, is, to is well, the way I say it to my wife, who is a startup uh, CEO, um, is that you spend half your time uh, in fi raising money, you spend half your time in human resources, basically being a psychotherapist, and then the other half of your time you spend actually doing work and running the company. And that's a permanent case because, um, because uh, lacks of, lack of empathy or lack of understanding or conflicts or you know, competition or all this stuff, um, it's like your closet at home. It, it, you know, it clutters and fills up the space that's allotted. <laughs> so part of your job as a leader is to trash that space and not give it too much, too much room to, uh, to expand and flourish. Um, and it, once bad energy starts, it bounces around, boing, 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 and it, uh, it becomes a, a downward, non-virtuous cycle. The other thing I would say is that uh, one of the things we had going at General Magic, we, where we needed more managers, as you heard, uh, is we actually needed more leaders. Um, because what we were counting on is that the idea itself was so powerful and so clear and so compelling that uh, if we hired people who, who in their brains were like uh, heat-seeking missiles, they guide themselves to the heat. And so my job, the way I actually explained it to people, was to hold this uh, kind of you know, bright, you know, burning torch very clearly and then hire people who, have, who are heat-seeking missiles. They would go to that flame. <laughs> so we wouldn't have to push them or pull them. They would just go there because that's where they went. I think that's partly true now. I think that one of the roles of a leader is to make the, the vision or the purpose, telos, the purpose so compelling that people are willing to suppress conflicts and, you know, quite frankly, um, the technical term for it is bullshit, uh, that happens in an organization um, and subsume that underneath a higher purpose. Uh, of, of doing something. And after all, we actually, as people, we flourish, we grow, we like purpose. When you go to work in the morning and you don't have purpose, you're miserable. And so, um, in fact, a leader or a strong manager, I think that, that continues to focus on the mission or continues to focus on why we're here doing this hard thing, um, is going to have to do less HR psychotherapy and more actual real work. And progress. Let's actually interject uh, Rodrigo's question. Rodrigo Perez is asking a related topic, which is, you know, can you teach or even foster that moonshot thinking, or is it something that the environment uh, fosters, or do you have to hire people who are already visionaries? And related to that, Carlos uh, Fernando Aguilar is asking if uh, there's anything uh, that you would tell somebody who is ready to do something amazing, uh, who's going to embark on an amazing journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, for me, the context of all this is that w when you watch General Magic, what you watch and witness is this process of somebody, a team being consumed by a cause, right? By, by this idea and vision. And, and so many of us want to experience that in our lifetimes. 
it's something it's the purpose that you're talking about you know like we want to love like there's no tomorrow like romeo and juliet and we want to be consumed by something meaning purpose in life and so uh, emmanuel and carlos are talking about you know, how do you get there how do you bring that on well you know it's it, it's interesting when we talk about children sometimes we talk about both nature and nurture that and i think that's exactly the question that was asked or the comment that was made is how much of it is the nature of the person who wants to be in the environment that, you know, that, I mean, why is there a keynote addressed by, you know, some random guy, Mark Peratt, with this kind of random movie? It's because it touches this very question of what's inside you? Is it, what, is it your nature to uh, be one of these people? Uh, and, or is it that you're brought into an environment that, that, that is nurturing, that actually brings that out of you and, and doesn't try and suppress you. And this is, a, you know, this is a chicken and egg question that we always ask, you know, which comes first, and to which the answer is they come at the same time. Now, there's a lot of self-selection going on. So people who feel or believe or want to believe, uh, and I think that, you know, the, the thousands of people <laughs> participating here are those who, who either believe or want to believe or are told by others You've got it, you know, it. It's like in Hollywood, there's the it, you know, person, you know, the it. Act. If you've got it, um, and, you, and I can't define it for you because it's, it's it. It's what you feel in yourself or what others are conferring upon you, you're projecting on you, and you want to do it, then, you, then as you said, you have no choice. That's the love part. You know, you are obsessed with having to experience that experience. Um, if it and you go into the wrong environment, you uh, you won't make it. You just won't make it, and um, and your boss, you know, <laughs> will say to you, "I don't think it's a fit. I think there's, you know, why? Because you're going to be disruptive. You're going to be a pain in the ass. <laughs> um, you know, you're going to have opinions. It's like, wow, you know, the, the, the last thing we need right now is more opinions. Just get down to work, and you know, I want to see a thousand lines of code by tomorrow." Um, or whatever. Um, but if you are lucky enough to find a good culture or even one person inside a big culture, one mentor or one colleague or a tiny little group, um, that's a good thing. Um, and that little tiny group can, can actually be the nurturing uh, vessel uh, for you to be able to, you know, to, to grow and enjoy life. Doesn't mean that that little group will be successful because they themselves um, are disruptors or they themselves are maybe not you know, trying to move faster than the culture wants them to move, um, have more ideas than the culture wants them to have, you know, are more likely to say, uh, why? Why are you asking me to do this? That doesn't make sense to me. And th that's, those are not comfortable questions for some managers, you know, who, uh, who just assume, uh, just you know, say what needs to be done and then have people go off and do it. By the way, sometimes those managers are absolutely right. They know better. And when they say, you know, go charge that mountain, they mean that mountain, not this one. And so if you're lucky enough to be with a good manager, then take their commands because they're good managers. <laughs> Sounds authoritarian, but that's a, you know, businesses are not democracies. Mark, we have uh, six minutes left and the last three minutes, I wanna talk about the future, which is actually the most popular question on the chat window. So I'm gonna fire uh, a few quickies, like 10 second answers. Um, one of the questions is uh, from uh, Danny Meat, uh, who wants to know if you had any IP considerations when you were uh, building General Magic, and he wants to know your overall opinion on whether IP actually helps with uh, creativity or not. Um, then uh, there's a question about video games. Uh, Emmanuel Fontan wants to know if you uh, thought about including gaming, video gaming in the device uh, for General Magic when you created it back then. Uh, so let's start with us a uh, couple uh, and then we'll go to the future question. Okay, well, very brief because we have a little bit of time. Um, by the way, having said that, I'm, I, I'm happy to continue if, uh, if the organizers want me to continue. It's, this, is, uh, this is fun and interesting. Good questions. Um, our culture did not like IP. Um, kind of weird, um, uh, because it turns out that IP is very valuable. I mean, one of the reasons why Tony was able to sell Nest 
uh, to Google for you know many billions of dollars is because he had developed an IP portfolio. But but in our culture at the time, um, we were more interested in spreading the idea and letting as many people as possible use it, build on it. We weren't exactly open source, but pretty close, pretty close. In the way that Android is, you know, kind of, it's not open source either, but it's pretty close uh, because uh, the model is the more people use it, the better it is it becomes. More people are banging on it, you know, and, and, and stress testing it. And so keep it open. Um, having said that, uh, we weren't litigious. You know, we didn't believe in suing people. Nobody sued us. Having said that, when, when the company went down, which is a few years after I left, uh, several years after I left, um, the chief scientist of Microsoft bought our patents for Telescript and, uh, and the operating system. And, uh, you know, they're, they're valuable, obviously. So that's that question. I, you know, do I believe in IP? Sure, I do. Um, I think it's important to develop a patent portfolio, but I also think that open source companies um, uh, can be just as successful and have just as big an impact. Depends what you, depends on your orientation. Did not think about video games. I personally don't use them, don't like them. I mean, I, I shouldn't say that exactly because it's so popular, but it's not, it's not part of my, uh, you know, things I'm interested in. Thank you so much. And the, the last question in the last three minutes, the organizers tell me that unfortunately there's a hard stop okay, at no exactly 7 p.m. or 3 p.m. our time. Sure. So um, the question is, uh, since you're really good at peeking into the future, do you have a vision for the future of technology? What comes next? And I would like you uh, to also address some of the work you have done after General Magic that is just so timely and relevant right now uh, regarding climate change and, uh, you know, what is... Uh, society, human, human, humanity's reaction to what's coming. So, uh, tell us what's the future. Yeah, and, and picking up on it real, really quickly, we only have a minute and twenty-two. Um, a peak experience is something that I hope all of you, each of you, you know, has at least once uh, in your work. And my best advice is, if you're whatever it is you're working on, if at one point you just are in flux, you know, you, you turn from a human being into just an energy, you know, pot of soup. Um, stay there. That's a very precious moment, no matter where it's going to take you. Uh, you were, Rebecca, you were, uh, you know, using Buddhist metaphors. This is Dharma. If you're flowing, don't, you know, don't let anything interrupt it. Nothing. Don't eat. Don't sleep. Don't talk to anybody. Just flow with that, you know, turn into just a pure bundle of energy and go with it. Because you're near a peak experience at that moment. You may only get to experience it once. Or if you're, you know, uh, you know, uh, Albert Einstein says, if he can think one minute a day, he's had a good day. One minute. Um, let's see. So, um, yeah, after, after General Magic, there was a, you know, I had a personal collapse, which I was kind of open about in the film. It was really painful. I had to uh, withdraw a bit from... Uh, from a tech and, uh, and, and then look to something that, and the only thing that was engaging enough, that was kind of meaningful enough, uh, TILO, purpose, uh, was climate change. So I went off and created three companies uh, that, that are in the clean tech space. And those are very interesting companies and I, you know, that's what I, that's what I, I did. Um, and now what I'm doing, and uh, as I referred to before, is in Napa, uh, California, I'm building uh, a, a compound uh, which is a which is a leadership retreat uh, for small teams, ten people or so, to come and ask really big questions in a completely secure, cyber secure, secure environment. Because the world is upside down, all assumptions are upside down, and uh, and threatened. And so now is the time to ask really fundamental questions of now what? Now what do we do? And Mark, I, I'm told we have ten seconds. So in in a couple Perfect. of what is the future technology they should be looking at? Um, it's a hyphenate. I know that. And I would look at uh, quantum computing hyphen something. Uh, and it might be hyphen machine learning. Uh, you put those things together and something amazing is going to happen. Thank you for, uh, for being letting me be with you. This was fantastic. And, you know, a lot of food for thought. I always tell everyone that you have to have pen and paper when they talk to Mark because there's so much to process and digest over time. Mariano, muchísimas gracias por esta oportunidad y te paso el micrófono. Que tengan buenas noches a todos. It has been a privilege to have you both here. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Rebecca.